So the question of territory, here's a standard definition that you might get if you're doing a political science or international relations uh, course, and the question of territory gets raised part of Max Weber's famous definition of the state. So he says the state is that human community which within a certain area or territory, and this area he stresses belongs to the feature, belongs to the state, has a successful monopoly of legitimate physical violence. Now the word that Weber uses here is the German word that might mean area or region rather than just territory, but it's a suggestion about how the interlinked nature of these concepts go, so that we then think about the state, the political uh, unit of the state, the polity, as having four key elements within it. The human community, so a group of people together, the second one being this geographical element, the territory, the area, or the region within which those people are. Then this idea of a monopoly of legitimate physical violence, the idea that this is that only a state should have an army, only a state should have a police force, only the state should have prisons and judicial apparatus for so on. And then the fourth, the idea that this is tied to an idea of legitimacy. You might well have other political actors in this area, this territory, that lay claim to these things, but only the state has got legitimacy. Now, three of those elements are widely discussed in the work on Weber and on the work on political science more generally. There's a lot of stuff about community, there's a lot of stuff about uh, violence, and there's a lot of stuff about legitimacy. But it seemed to me that territory was one that was largely assumed, largely taken as unproblematic, not something that needed the same kind of conceptual development and thought that those other ideas needed. That seemed to me at least to be a problem. Two standard ways that the idea of territory is defined in a lot of the literature, and, and I'm going to say something about why I think they're problematic in a moment, but one of them is the idea that territory can be understood through the notion of territoriality. Territoriality, which has a background in work on animal ethology, the idea that animals will lay claim to a specific portion of the Earth's surface in a hunting ground or a mating area, and that those animals will try and exclude other animals from that area, that they will try and control and regulate it, and that the animals lay claim to a portion of space or landscape around themselves. The suggestion being that humans are not that dissimilar. You shut a door to a study if you want to be undisturbed. You put a fence around your garden because you want that to be your garden rather than your neighbors to walk through it. A farmer may put up a gate to stop people walking through his fields. These kinds of practices, the suggestion is, are territoriality, and that therefore we can understand territory as the thing that is produced through that type of behavior. The second way that people have traditionally understood territory is to say it's a bounded space, it's a bordered uh, area of the, the Earth's surface, and that people lay claim to that. Anthony Giddens, the sociologist, then defining the state as, in his terms, a bordered power container. You put a wall or a fence or a barrier around something, you lay claim to it, and you have created a territory. Both of those seem to me to have some use in thinking about these questions, but both of them seem to me to be rather general, not very specific. It seems to me that if you think that a, a room that you've closed the door to, a lecture room that you police access into, uh, an area of a city that you might lay claim to. If all of these are territories, then territory ceases to be particularly useful because it becomes applicable to just about any kind of space. So you get the standard kinds of definitions, and often this is where people stop, that they suggest that you can have a definition of territory, and then all of the complexities come from particular territories, particular territorial arrangements, particular disputes about who lays claim to a portion of land and so on. So people keep talking about this area or this portion of space that has got some kind of boundary or restriction around it, and that there is a power relation that is controlling that, that is allowing access in or out, uh, and these are the relations that you need to understand. Then all of the complexity comes from when you look at this in every particular practice or, or every particular territorial arrangement or, or understanding. But for me, a question arose from this, where did these ideas come from? Have we always thought the same way about how you might lay claim to these portions of land or police them? And it seemed to me that there we had some complexities around how people understood these kinds of relations. So I was thinking, well, how am I going to do this kind of work? How am I going to track the emergence of a concept of territory in Western political thought, in Western political practice? And, and I want to stress that my work has been on the Western tradition of political thought and political practice around these. I think if you were looking at 
for example, a Chinese or an Indian or a Japanese uh, history of these, you'd find something rather different in terms of how these things came about. But this was the focus that I had on these questions. So two books that were very useful to me, uh, Edward Casey's book on another geographical concept, the notion of place, where he sketches what he calls a philosophical history, thinking about the idea of place and how place relates to the question of space and to track that through Western thought to see how place was, in his terms, increasingly obscured by this overarching notion of space. So something in the kind of the method or the scale of what he was doing was useful to me. The other one came from a, became a, a French geographer, Jean Gottman, who was born uh, outside of France, who became a French geographer, who did a lot of work on political geography. And he said it's almost impossible to think about the state without the spatial definition, its territory. So this then became another aspect of this. If the, the relation between space and place was important for thinking about the history of territory, so too was the relation of territory to the question of the state. And another writer, French writer, who wrote a book called The Invention of Territory, which treats a slightly different historical period to the one I'm interested in, says that territory always seems to be linked to possible definitions of the state. It gives the, the state a kind of a physical basis, a particular area of the Earth's surface that it is laying claim to, which seems to render the state as something that is inevitable and eternal. But the two seems in that definition seem to me to be the very much, much the question. If we could interrogate the way that we thought about the question of territory, how might that change how we think about the question of the state? How might uh, approaching the question of territory be another way to interrogate the history of the state as a concept and as a practice within Western thought? So this is what led me to eventually to write two books on the question of territory. The one on the, uh, the right uh, is the one that I actually started first. This is the book that became The Birth of Territory, published in 2013. And it is that history of the concept of territory in Western thought and Western practice. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But while I was writing the book, every time I gave a lecture on the question of territory, people would say to me something along these lines. All this stuff you're doing on the Middle Ages is all very well, but how does this relate to anything that's going on today? And so initially I wrote one article, which then grew into another article and eventually became a book, which was to say, okay, here's how I think the political conceptual work I'm doing on the question of territory helps us to understand something that is going on at the moment. And this is the book on the left, a book called Terror and Territory, the Spatial Extent of Sovereignty, which was to try to look at the way that the territory sovereignty relation was changing not just in the war on terror, narrowly understood from September 11, 2001 onwards, but really in a longer period, particularly since the end of the Cold War, and how people um, were trying to understand the relation between these, these political concerns of territory and particularly sovereignty. And so that book, I put the, the historical work aside for a couple of years where I worked on this book and then returned to the historical work to say, now I'm going to try and finish that project that I was been working on. It took me the best part of a decade to write the historical book on the question of territory. Now, I'm not going to say very much uh, other than right at the end when I give a couple of examples about the historical story that I try to say. What I'm going to try and do today is connect this much more again to contemporary issues and some of the things that I think some of you uh, are interested in and thinking about. But it's a historical study that started with ancient Greek myth and tragedy and went up to the late 17th, early 18th century, tracing through uh, political texts, theological texts, literary texts, different ways in which the understanding of the relation between place and power was understood, out of which the modern notion of territory emerged at a particular point in time. I'm not going to talk about the historical work there. But in order to try to interrogate those kind of historical texts that I think were revealing about how place-power relations were understood at different times and in different places, I tried to think about not a better definition of territory, but the kinds of registers that we would need to interrogate to understand how territory had been understood and practiced in those different times and in those different places. And it seemed to me that there were ways that we could approach this question that would shed light on the ways that these things had been understood and practiced. One of them was a way of thinking about the question of land. Now, I thought that land was crucial to understanding territory, but it didn't seem to me to be sufficient to grasp the complexities of it. And land, it seemed to me, was quite often forced into a political economic register. You think about land as in what can that land yield for you, either in terms of the crops or the agriculture that can come for it, 
or the rent that you can charge for people to live on. Quite quickly, then, land becomes simply a political economic relation. And that seemed to me to be absolutely crucial, but not on its own sufficient to get at the question of territory. The second one that I started thinking about was what I called for shorthand the notion of terrain. And I'll say much more about terrain later in the lecture. And this was thinking about it in terms of the strategic, military, political kind of control that might be laid claim over there. Terrain obviously links to geology, to physical geography, but also to the military. There's a lot of work in military geography that looks at, for example, if you've got a tank battalion that's moving through a landscape, is the ground strong enough to support those tanks? Or if you're going through sand, are they going to start to sink into that sand? Uh, you have a lot of work in military geography about laying claim to the high ground because this gives you a strategic advantage in terms of these questions. So there's work on that in that register and also, of course, the work in physical geography about that. So there was a political strategic register of questions that I thought were important alongside the political economic. But territory, it seemed to me, still was more than either of those two uh, alone or, or taken in combination. So the first set of questions that I wanted to add beyond the political economic and the political strategic alone was what I called the political legal. How do understandings of power, law, authority, supremacy, sovereignty, superiority, how do these relate to the things over which that jurisdiction, that power is exercised or laid claim to? And you can understand this in some senses, if you move outside the boundaries of one state, the legal regime that you are subject to changes. You cross over a border from France to Germany and you are subject to some of the same laws because of the European Union, but different laws because you've moved between one jurisdiction to another. And there were a whole set of debates historically that were around these kinds of questions. How does the law apply to a particular place? Where does the law stop applying? If you have a conflict between two people in another place, which legal regime applies in those kinds of instances? These kind of questions, the political legal, seem to me to be very important in getting at, at the complexities of territory. The second one was the political technical, was thinking about how geometry, cartography, land surveying, military science, how do these kinds of things affect how we think about the question of territory? And it seemed to me that there were a whole lot of things that happened in the scientific revolution, roughly from the 15th uh, to the 17th centuries within Western Europe, that transformed how political actors became states, started to think about the land that they lay claim to. At this time, you can see a large increase in large-scale mapping projects, land surveying, of marking out where boundaries actually are on the surface of the earth, rather than having some notional sense of where they might be. These kinds of things going along at the same kind of time as what um, Foucault, for example, has talked about in terms of the development of an understanding of population. How do things like statistics, political arithmetic, the emergence of the census as a counting of bodies, a counting of people, how do these relate to the similar kinds of practices that are going on with the, uh, the, the emergence of the notion of territory? So what I meant with the political technical was not simply the technological, although I think that is important in there, but the techniques as in sort of arts or practices or modes of doing something. And this is why I came to the idea of thinking about territory as a political technology. It's not simply the technological, though I think that's important, but it's to do with what is being done to the land and the terrain. What sorts of things like measuring, controlling, building, uh, excluding, including, these kinds of actions or practices or technologies that are going on that I think shape this way of thinking about it. So then territory for me is a political question, yes, a geographical question, of course, but thinking about it in those four registers, the economic, the strategic, the legal, and the technical. And that seemed to me to get at some of the complexities around the way these kinds of relations have been understood historically, but also to point towards how we might think about those things today. Now, in the Terror and Territory book, one of the remarks I made in the, the introduction, which I didn't make an enormous amount of in that book, but I've begun to think about a bit more since I'll come to the, the, the key point of the quote. What I was trying to suggest here is too often we think about territory as kind of flat surface. We think about this in the way that if you look at a map that shows where the boundary line is between two states, and we see these two states meeting like this with a boundary line drawn in between them, and that's how we tended to think about territory as a kind of flat area surface. But one of the points that I made in the, the Terror and Territory book was two of the um, 
actions by, by terrorist organizations that had provoked the most extreme responses by states were attacks that came from the air. The Katosha rockets launched from southern Lebanon by Hezbollah into northern Israel and the attacks on September 11, 2001. These were actions that took place not on the surface but from the air. And there's a long heritage of the vulnerability of states recognizing attack from the air. You can track this back to the first bombs that were dropped from hot air balloons or from, from aircraft in the, the beginning of the 20th century through to the uh, bomber airplanes attacking civilian populations in the Second World War and the vulnerability that this gave to the states um, that had previously been able to defend a front line uh, and that the civilians behind that front line were relatively safe uh, from attack. The change of attitude in the Second World War, particularly with the bombing of civilian populations, tracing this through the 20th century, but also the vulnerability that the atomic bomb and intercontinental ballistic missiles gave the states. One of the arguments that was used about this was it was taking the lid off the state, that you couldn't have the state anymore as this simple bordered power container because you couldn't control attack from above. But the response to the Katosha rockets and to the September 11th attacks were a series of attacks that were launched by Israel, by the US and their allies, also from the air. The aerial bombardment of Afghanistan, the aerial bombardment of Iraq, the shock and awe of the early days of the Iraq war, all of these were aerial assaults. So it seemed to me if you were thinking about territory, we needed to take that vertical dimension into account to think about how territory was a volume rather than simply an area. Now there's a lot of work on what's come to be called uh, vertical geopolitics to think about those kinds of questions, of thinking about uh, bombing, thinking about missiles, thinking about that vulnerability, and opening up a vertical dimension above the surface dimension to those questions. What I was interested in was how you could connect this into a much broader sense of territory as a volume, a three-dimensional space rather than a two-dimensional space. And the key person that has inspired a lot of this work is an Israeli architect, uh, is A.O. Weissman. Now, A.O. Weissman has written a number of, of texts, but one of them is this book, Hollow Land, which is called Israel's Architecture of Occupation. And it's trying to suggest the way that we should understand the complexities of what is happening, particularly in the West Bank, through Israel's practices there. And he's suggesting that we need to think about a vertical dimension if we're to take these questions into account. He says, if we look at the maps that are regularly produced to show that complexity, they fail to get at the real nature of the entangled relations there because two-dimensional maps cannot understand the complexities of the vertical dimension of, of those uh, issues. I'm not going to read the whole of these quotes, but I'll talk through some of the issues that they, they raise there. Maps, he suggests, are very important as strategic technical tools by states by political actors in controlling and laying claim to particular areas. But he suggests that the way that we've tended to understood this has tended to be too flat. It's tended to think too much of a single um, two-dimensional surface rather than the complexities of height and depth beyond that. But he suggests if you look at some of the uh, proposed accords for how the Israel-Palestine situation might be resolved, both in Oslo in 92-93 uh, and to Camp David in 2000, the suggestion that they made was how complex the situation was on the ground and above and below the ground was that you needed a different type of representation in order to come to uh, terms with the complexities of these kinds of issues. So instead, what they decided to do was to layer maps on top of each other to try to understand the different ways that you might think about those complexities. So this is an example. This is my own photograph and nearly all the other photographs that follow on my own. But this is an image that he has on the front cover of his map of his book on this, the Hollow Land book. And what he says here is this gives you an example of the complexities of three dimensions that are going on there. You can see the road going from the bottom of the map towards the top of the map, which is on elevated platforms. It's got uh, either side of the road barriers on either side, so that, that road is isolated from the landscape over which it is traversing. But on the valley floor, you can see another road snaking along there. The one on the top the higher dimension there is an Israeli road to link settlements back to Israel within its pre-67 borders so that you can get from a settlement through the landscape directly to the place that you're going. But what you have on the surface is a Palestinian road which is uh, linking the villages within that landscape. So what he's suggesting there is there is a layering of different types of transport geography or transport sovereignty, we might say, one over the top of the other. 
if you're trying to represent that on a regular map, you wouldn't be able to grasp the complexity of that landscape. He also talks about places like the Temple Mount, which has got a mosque on top of it, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is a, a sacred site in Islam, but this is built on the foundations of the old Jewish temple, and so there are tunnels underneath that site where you have a Jewish sacred uh, space, and so again, you have a vertical layering of different types of questions there, and that a two-dimensional map wouldn't be able to understand the complexity of that in its situation. So inspired by some of that work, I began thinking about other spaces that he doesn't talk about so much within the West Bank and the surrounding region where some of these kinds of issues uh, were at stake. This is an area called E1. Uh, it's to the east of East Jerusalem. And the time I went there, you had everything there but the buildings of the houses for a new settlement. You have the roads, you have the road signs, you even have a crosswalk. You have all the electricity uh, grid and infrastructure. You have things underneath for the infrastructure of these particular settlements. But so far, no houses. The argument was being that this couldn't be classed as an Israeli settlement in this disputed area because there were no houses built there. Let me show you this on a map. If you look at the, the green line is the pre-67 borders of Jerusalem. Israel, since the 67 war, has extended its control beyond that and the red dotted line is the wall that it is now building. As you can see, it encompasses a large area beyond the boundaries of pre-67 Jerusalem. Israel has annexed large areas. This is not a legally recognized annexation, but Israel claims areas that it calls East Jerusalem, which are now extending further and further east into the West Bank. And you can see, and you heard Sir Chris point, settlement Mara Amin here, which is on the road out towards Jericho, yellow color is the area between the furthermost extent of what Israel calls East Jerusalem through to that area of Mala Adamin. So it's a very important strategic area because of its location. If Israel fully builds there and it builds the wall around there, it will almost cut the West Bank in two, a northern and a southern West Bank. And this is why this area is so important out there, because otherwise Israeli settlements will extend all the way out to Jericho, which is almost in the Jordan Valley. So this area is a highly contested area, and as I suggested, Israel is doing everything but building the actual houses there. This is one of the views of the landscape that I took from where he's there. You may be able to see in the background some electricity pylons which are linking this area into the wider network of the spaces that are being constructed around here, but you can see it's a very desolate landscape. And yet if I turn from the view that I was taking there just to my right, you can see the one building that is in Area E1, at least when I visited it, which is the largest police station in the West Bank, built on top of the hill, because again, it gives that strategic sense of the control uh, over the landscape. And height is important in terms of a number of Israeli settlements. You see the number of Israeli settlements within the West Bank are built on top of the hills. The hills giving them a particular strategic location in terms of the places uh, that they can control. And you can see in this one, I'll show you better pictures in a moment, of some elements of that West Bank wall that have been built in those areas. But it would be a mistake to think that the wall is the only wall that is being built within the West Bank. One of the things in going there is it's not this simple idea of you cross over a line and you've moved from Israeli to Palestinian jurisdiction. There are many walls, many roadblocks, many ways that the, uh, the space is fragmented and constructed through urban programs, through landscape, through uh, architecture, and so on. This is a wall standing where I was when I took the photo, was standing inside an Israeli settlement. The wall has painted on it the view of the landscape that the wall obscures, except that the Palestinian village that you could see on the other side does not appear in the painting, the representation of this. So that you would have a number of these settlements that will have walls or, or security apparatus built around them, uh, but then we're often erase the traces of what might be on the other side of that wall. And so this is the sort of the wider context for which a photo like this uh, that I took and that, that Weissman uses on, in the front cover of the book um, are, are situated within. Another place that I visited when I was doing some of this work was the Israel-Lebanon border. This was right up in the north of Israel uh, on the coastline, uh, a place called Rosh Hanikra. And this is standing there right by the, as far as you can go north on this border. This is one year after the, uh, the war with Hezbollah, between Israel and Hezbollah in 2006. And you can see on the sign, 
um, the distance to Jerusalem and the distance to Beirut. But this is no longer a line that you can actually cross. The only time that these gates are open um, tends to be when Israel is launching a, a ground invasion into southern Lebanon. There's a UN force there in a, a supposed buffer zone to try and keep the sides apart there. But this is a, even though there is a gate, and it says, and I don't know if you can see this, above that gate, welcome to Rosh Hanikra, the border crossing. This is a closed gate. This is not a border that you can cross uh, between. But I was interested in terms of this because of the landscape and because of the infrastructure that was built over the top of it. This is now looking eastwards along that border line between Israel and Lebanon. The security infrastructure that is built there, including things like missile detection systems, early warning systems, and so on, because this is the border over which Israel uh, launched its attacks, but also Hezbollah was shooting its rockets from southern Lebanon into northern Israel. So there's a vertical dimension there, both in terms of the infrastructure that is built above the surface, but also in terms of the attacks that were going on over that uh, area. But what I was particularly interested in was what was underneath as well. You may have been able to see from those images, this is a very rocky landscape. It's steep cliffs rising up from the sea. And there are tunnels underneath there that used to way, be a way of crossing between what was then Mandate Palestine and Lebanon to the north. These tunnels used to be part of a railway that the British built in the colonial area, the British French uh, built through the areas that they controlled after the First World War uh, under the Saint-Picot Agreement. And those tunnels, you can go into to a certain point, but then they stop because this is where you would be crossing into the border underneath, in a sense, the surface of where you would cross between Israel and Lebanon. And those are blocked because in the war, um, when Israel declared independence um, in 48 and the uh, Arab forces from a number of neighboring states attacked, um, Jewish forces destroyed the tunnels so that you couldn't use this as an underneath way of accessing into the territory of this newly declared state. So that they have blocked off this area uh, to protect a sort of securing way, but securing below the surface. This is uh, the sandbags in the tunnel entrance, if you're looking at it, where the old railway would have crossed into uh, Israel from uh, Lebanon. So again, a subsurface way of thinking about those kinds of questions. And of course, if you go and look at the wall itself, um, this is in Abu Dis, looking at the wall from the supposedly Israel side, but I think it's much more complicated than simply an Israeli and a Palestinian side to the wall. And the wall has that vertical dimension too. This is twice as high as the Berlin Wall. I saw the Berlin Wall when the Berlin Wall was still standing, other than as just a bit of a museum. This is twice as high as the Berlin Wall was, but there's a whole set of other infrastructure around how the wall is structured. Here you can see also the way that the wall uh, loops around in order to keep an Israeli settlement on the right-hand side of the road there onto the supposedly Israeli side of it. So this is a, a very complicated path that the wall has taken to think about these kind of questions. So what I was trying to do here was to think about the vertical, to think about also the subsurface, things like tunnels and so on. And there's a whole range of examples that could be given for how we might think about those kinds of questions. And there was a whole range of, of theoretical work I was interested in, but I was particularly struck by a line from uh, a piece that Foucault wrote about a French artist, uh, where he talks about uh, the way that the vertical is not simply, I think he should say not simply rather than not one of the dimensions of space, but it is certainly a dimension of power. The vertical gives a whole set of change about how you might think about a landscape and how you might construct power relations uh, around those questions. Okay. So that was the sense of trying to think about territory as a volume. And some of that work is, is continuing into some of the issues that I'm interested in at the moment, thinking about the notion of terrain again. One of the things I said came out of that historical political work around the idea of territory was the idea of thinking about territory as something that clearly connects to land and terrain, but cannot be simply understood as either land or terrain. One of the things I've been doing more recently is actually going back both to land and terrain and trying to think a bit more about those concepts and think more about the complicated nature uh, of each of those categories. I'll say a very little bit about land, but then I'll turn to terrain for the last part of the lecture. One of the writers which some of you may be familiar with, Henri Lefebvre, uh, well known today as an, an urban theorist, well known today for a book he wrote on the production of space, but Lefebvre's earliest work on these kinds of questions came out of his interest in rural uh, politics. And Lefebvre lived initially in the Pyrenees. He was born there. He had a family home there. He would return to as often as possible. 
And in the area that he uh, grew up, um, the old town of Navarrense, they discovered oil and sulfur deposits nearby. And so they built both the extractive machinery to pull the oil and the, the sulfur from the landscape. But they also built a new town uh, as a place where you could put all of the workers that were going to work in these areas. So Lefebvre saw a transformation of a predominantly rural landscape to a predominantly industrial urban landscape happening in an area that he knew very well. And this was one of the things that started his work on the transition from the rural to the urban, or what he called the process of urbanization. And he collected a number of his essays in this book, From the Rural to the Urban, uh, tracking that transition. So from predominantly rural work to the rural-urban transformation work to the urban work, which he's better known for today. One of the projects I have with a political economist, Adam David Morton, is to make some of Lefebvre's writings on the rural question uh, more widely available. Because one of the things that we think Lefebvre does in that work is to say, certainly the issues of ground rent are important when we understand land, but you can't reduce land simply to the economic uh, set of questions. You need to think about the material, the politics around those issues. And so what this might do, uh, these are a number of Lefebvre's books around this time and their rough English equivalents. There's a, a sort of a missing gap in the middle, one of which is this rural urban work. Another one is Lefebvre's only explicit book on architecture, which has only been in, published in English and only in the last couple of years. Uh, it's a book that was lost. Lefebvre sent it to uh, uh, somebody who was managing a project and said, can you use this? And was told, no, it doesn't really fit what we're going to do. And so Lefebvre abandoned it. The only copy that we know still exists was found in this uh, Spanish architect's basement. Um, the floodwater had come to here. The book happened to be on a shelf that was here. And so this book was only just preserved. And it was published by a friend of mine, Lucas Stanak, uh, in the last couple of years. But there's other work in there, the rural urban transformation. There's also this book, Marxist Thought in the City, uh, which is going to be translated next year. Uh, and I'm going to be writing the preface to that book. So there's a, a set of connections of Lefebvre's work in that crucial period of the early 1970s. And some of the work I'm doing with others is to try and fill in that gap in Lefebvre's writing. Let me talk in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes or so about the question of terrain. One of the reasons I'm interested in the question of terrain is nothing to do with the geostrategic, which has been my own work, uh, but it's also to do with the fact that I'm a cyclist and things like mountains, like Mont Ventoux, which I did uh, two years ago and again this summer, you start to think about issues like the quality of the land, the slope of the land, if you're a cyclist cycling up a mountain. So there's a, a different sense of why I'm interested in these kind of questions as well. But terrain, how do we understand the notion of terrain? Standard English defi definition uh, from the Oxford English Dictionary, a tract of country considered with regard to its natural features, um, configuration, etc., in military use, especially as affecting tactical advantages, fitness for maneuvering, etc., but also an extent of ground, region, district, or territory. So there's the kind of geostrategic and the geophysical together in this notion of terrain, which I'm interested in thinking about. I used to be in a geography department, and one of the uh, physical geographers there wrote a piece on terrain analysis. I thought this would be a good place to look for what physical geographers understood by terrain. And the definition he gives is, by terrain analysis, we mean the quantitative analysis of terrain. Not, for me, a terribly helpful definition, because what it seems to think is important is to qualify the mode of analysis, but not the object of analysis. So what terrain is seems to me to be completely unquestioned in that. And a lot of physical geography makes a distinction between land form and land process. Terrain is land form, but the process is where the interesting things are happening. What is happening to that uh, landscape? What's happening to that transformation? And so geomorphology is looking at those kinds of questions. It seemed to me that terrain itself was worth interrogating. Some of the most interesting work on this is being done by an anthropologist, Gaston Gordillo. Um, who recently published a book called Rubble, The Afterlife of Destruction, which is a very interesting book, looking at what happens after military strategic commands have, have done things to landscapes, to traces in a landscape following military intervention. But he stresses the notion of how we must think about the materiality to think about the question of territory. And he thinks about it through a geometrical examination of bodies in motion. So this raises for me a number of questions about how we might think about the idea of terrain. One of the ways that people do this is to look at it in the way that I suggested earlier. How does the landscape impact on the military? And a very interesting recent piece by Derek Gregory 
called The Natures of War, initially a lecture and then published more recently, looks at this and his examples are the muddy landscapes of the First World War, the trench warfare, the jungles of Southeast Asia through the Vietnam and related conflicts in the 60s and the 70s, through to the deserts both of the Africa campaign of the Second World War, but also the deserts of Iraq uh, today in more recent uh, times. So that's certainly a very important way of looking at that way that the physical landscape impacts on the military. There's also some very interesting work that's being done that sort of reverses that way of thinking. Instead of what's the impact of the physical landscape on the military, what's the impact of the military on the physical landscape? And so Shiloh Krupa's book, Hot Spotters Report, which looks at the legacies, particularly in the southwest of the United States, of military and particularly um, nuclear weapons and other uh, weapon technology testing, what has this done to particular landscapes in those areas? And more closer to home for those of us in the UK, uh, Rachel Woodward's book, Military Geographies, which again looks at the traces of the military on a landscape. Where have there been camps? Where have there been missile ranges? Where have there been areas of land that have been reserved for military use? If you look at an ordnance survey map, a leisure map of area, you will regularly find these areas that are off bound, out of bounds for people to go into because of military use. She's trying to think about what are those kinds of traces that are left uh, through the transformation that the military might make on landscape. So for me, this then becomes a, a, an interesting question of the kind of materiality, the tracing of these kinds of relations through physical landscape and how this might impact on how we think about uh, uh, political geographical uh, questions more generally. There's some sort of heavy theory behind this, and I'm not going to talk about much about that, although I can talk more in, in questions that people are interested in. But I was particularly struck by uh, a feminist philosopher's work, Elizabeth Gross, where she proposes this idea of geopower. And she says, we talk about geopolitics, and we talk about, if we're interested in Foucault, biopolitics and biopower and so on. But what about a notion of geopower, of which human power is only a small subset of particular kinds of power relations? So she says the relations between the earth and its various forces and living beings and they're not always distinguishable forces are forms of geopower if power is understood as the engagement of clashing competing forces. Power understood as relations between humans or perhaps more generally between living things is a certain historically locatable capitalization on the forces of geopower. So how might we use that to open up the way that we think about some of these questions in a political geographical register to look at things such as natural resources, the interactions of human environment, things that are going on without any kind of human involvement, uh, things between the relation between the biosphere, the atmosphere and the lithosphere, things that are there in the question of territory and state spatial strategies, but that states and other political actors can only do so much to transform these kinds of questions. And there are various people that have written about things that I think are, are useful from the more philosophical, um, Manuel de Lander and John Patevi's work, to the more literary in Jonathan Bates' work, that I think is helpful in raising those kinds of questions. John Patevi raises this idea of what he calls geo-hydro-solar biotechnopolitics, to get at that sense of all of the complexity of the relations that we might want to uh, interrogate around this. Uh, Jane Bennett has done some very interesting work on what she calls vibrant matter, a new way of thinking questions of materiality. And then on the right, a, a, a collection of short stories by Ben Marcus, where objects have agency, animate objects, you might call them, about how we can think about these without simply a human-centered way of thinking about the question of agency. So I've begun thinking about how we might take the geophysical more seriously when we look at territory, and I'll particularly give you a few examples about this in relation to the question of borders. There are many ways people think about the question of borders. Uh, there's an old standing definition of the distinction between a border as a boundary and the border as a frontier. A standard way people tend to think about this, a boundary is a line, a line of nominally zero width. You cross over that line and you move from France into Germany. There's no transitional stage between you're either in France or you're in Germany. The other way of thinking about a border is as a frontier, and that's a zone. It has width. You move from one jurisdiction through an area, perhaps traditionally a kind of no-man's-land area, to an area that may have a weaker set of control over this, 
through that and then perhaps to something on the other side of that. A zone may be in, in all sorts of ways. Maybe a frontier is a cultural barrier or a cultural area of exchange between two people, perhaps on two banks of a river, for example, and the river is a good means of crossing between that. Or it may be a mountain range where you have an area that's not particularly easy to get into, and that may be more of a transitional area. It may be through a desert area where people are, are in um, areas that people live in on one side and areas that people live on the other side, but there's a large area is pretty much an area that you couldn't live in between those settlements. People think about boundaries in terms of the legal, economic, political. They think about them in terms of the technical. There's a lot of work about boundaries and how boundaries are surveyed, mapped, engineered, and so on. Uh, and there's also the material, and it's the material that I want to think about uh, with you just last, last part of the lecture. There's obviously the physical landscape of borders. If you go to borders, and I'll show you some examples in a moment, you can see where stones have been erected to say this is the border crossing between two places. Increasingly today, states are building walls or fences, or they're digging ditches or roads or roadblocks, or in some places like in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest between the US and Canada, they would cut a line through a forest so that you could see a line of a cleared vista to mark out the landscape uh, on the landscape, the line of this. In a very interesting piece on the Panama Canal, Thomas Siegler comes up with a line that I wish I'd thought of, the idea of the territorial palimpsest. Palimpsest is an old manuscript that has had an older text scratched out so that you can write again on that. But today, often, we can use uh, various technology, infrared technology and so on, to see what was written on the text initially. So there's a layering of text onto a, a piece of parchment, uh, and that you can see these different layers and what has been there before being scratched over and copied onto. He suggests that territory is much the same as this. You can see the material traces of past ways of constructing a landscape in the uh, current day setting of this. Good example from a town I grew up in, Colchester, is a Norman castle built on the remains of a Roman temple. And the Roman temple has tunnels underneath it that are all that remains of the old Roman temple. So it's a space a thousand years ago, somebody decided to reuse a space for a different political purpose but you can still today, a thousand years later, see those superimposed traces on the landscape. Another one would be the West Bank example I gave you of the al aqsa Mosque built on the foundations of the old Jewish temple. So you get those kind of material traces in the landscape, different ways you can think about that layering of those. Some boundaries today are still marked by fairly crude rudimentary ways. This is crossing from Swaziland uh, into South Africa. It's not one of the more heavily policed uh, borders, although it's becoming more policed because of a large number of people moving, uh, particularly from Zimbabwe into these two states. They're starting to uh, control their boundaries in, in a stricter way. You get other examples, such as the US-Mexico border, where they're starting to build a much more um, physical marker into the landscape. So this is looking uh, from the U on the US side, and on the right-hand side is Mexico, looking with the sea behind me. Uh, looking towards the, the landscape there, you can see the, the fence that has been constructed or the wall that's been constructed stretching into the distance. This is a fence that has got um, gaps between it so that small animals can pass between, but you couldn't get a human body uh, through those spaces. Uh, but it also runs out, and it runs out because it ends, and they've put up these things to stop vehicles uh, getting through at the end of this section of the wall. They're going to eventually going to fill this in entirely. But the, the reason with this is, if you look at this landscape, if you didn't have a vehicle, then this would not be a very easy place to move across by foot. So they're using the physical nature of the terrain, both in terms of the mountainous terrain, uh, but also in terms of the inhospitable nature of the terrain as part of that boundary that is being marked there on the landscape. There's also, though, much more of a sense of a frontier that's being created here. This is a little way uh, north of the actual marking of the border line but it's the kinds of satellite and other infrastructure that's there for the um, militias and the uh, police and, and security forces that are there to try and police this border. And you can also be stopped in southern Arizona and other states that border on Mexico some distance from the border on probable suspicion and asked to present your identity papers and so on. So they're creating this much more as a frontier uh, where different types of regimes can be used and regulated to try to construct this way of thinking about these questions. But I'm also interested, certainly the built landscape, but also interested in simply the, the, the physical landscape and the way that some of those questions are important. 
large number of borders historically, but many of these endure today, have used physical markers on the landscape to mark where borders between states are. Mountain ranges, uh, rivers, coastlines, deserts, and so on. Now, I don't want to suggest that we should return to any idea of what used to be called natural borders. This is a historical argument that people have made that there are natural limits to the expansion of political powers and that these would form uh, the boundaries of a particular state. You can see this even with the classical Roman Empire, that Rome expanded to the Rhine River uh, to the northeast, the, the Danube to the east, uh, the Sahara Desert to the south, and that Rome had other boundaries that were physical markers on the landscape that it used to mark off different areas of jurisdiction. So within the Roman Empire, the Alps was used as um, a dividing line between different provinces. The Rubicon River is famous. Crossing the Rubicon is a phrase because Julius Caesar crossed a very small river in northern Italy, but he crossed it not as a civilian but under military command, and that this was the thing that triggered the civil war in Rome, uh, Caesar versus Pompey. So that even the Roman Empire used these natural borders to mark things out. And where Rome couldn't find a physical marker on the landscape, it would build them. 200-odd miles north of here, Hadrian's Wall in northern Britain was one of those examples. But Rome kept expanding further north from there. It built another wall further north in modern-day Scotland, the Antonine Wall, realized that this was not defensible, so it retreated back to Hadrian's Wall. But all of those then were provisional. Rome, Rome sent several troops, several uh, battalions of troops, east of the Rhine River to try and conquer Germania and was unable to do that, and so then they retreated back behind the Rhine. So there are these historically... The idea re-emerged around the 17th century with France and that you had various French statesmen suggesting France has natural borders. So France's borders from the English Channel, the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean. You could also use the Pyrenees between France and Spain. Uh, you could use the Alps between France and Italy, France and Switzerland. Uh, and then in the north, uh, you could use the Rhine River as a way of marking out the natural boundaries of France. France should expand to those, but no further in terms of those questions. But people have often raised questions about those, and all of those borders from the, the very slow mountain ranges to the much more rapid rivers are actually dynamic features of the landscape that change. They don't stay in the same place. And this is an old question. I'm going to talk about river boundaries as my last example. River boundaries, I think, are interesting because a huge number of boundaries between states today either use rivers or cross rivers for part of the distance of those boundaries. But even going back to a 6th century codification of classical Roman law, rivers don't stay where they are. So what happens when rivers move? Well, Justinian's Institutes raises these questions. It says, what happens if a river changes direction and washes land from one bank onto the, land, onto the other bank of the river? Particularly, he's thinking about this in terms of farmers. If you have a river dividing two farmers' fields, who lays claim to the land on either side of the river if the river moves? What happens if an island emerges through increased uh, sediment in the middle of a river? Who can lay claim to that island? And who owns the rights to a dried-up riverbed? Today, these kind of questions are still important, but now at international law level of thinking about this between different states. You can do things to try and stop rivers moving, so the Rio Grande is a good example between the US and Mexico. You put it into a large concrete channel, and then you can regulate where that river actually is, and it doesn't move. But many other rivers move across the landscape through natural physical processes. This complicates some of those questions. Today, a lot of river boundaries, the line between states, is what they call the thalveg, or the navigable channel in a river. Now, that will move because of how rivers build up, and they often will dredge rivers to try and restore it to the same place. But these kind of questions of a dynamic nature of the physical landscape have been an issue for a long time. These go back to classical Rome. Rome worked on this in legal terms, but it also worked about this in terms of a practical geometry, an earth measuring, a field measuring, that people in the Corpus Agrimensorum Romanorum, the body of writings of the Roman land surveyors, were interested in how these kinds of questions, the second of the examples there has got a river there. How do you survey the land if there is a river in there, and how do you think about these questions? And we're told by Herodotus, the Greek historian, that the original geometers, the earth measurers, were the people that in ancient Egypt every year were sent out after the Nile River had flooded and then the water had subsided. The river had washed away all of the markers between the different farmers' fields, so you needed people with this practical art of geometry 
to go out and re-measure the fields and put the markers to show which farmer owns which portion of land. So this very physical, practical sense of geometry was the older way people thought about it. Over time, it becomes a, an abstract branch of mathematics. That's not the way that it was originally understood. Uh, a 14th century um, Roman jurist thinking about these kind of questions and combines the legal text with the rudimentary geometry to try to work out how you can think about uh, the shifting nature of the rivers and the dynamic way that this would transform a landscape. I'm going to come to the, um, I'm going to skip over that. There's a good example in a Shakespeare play, I won't read the whole uh, text, where in Henry IV, part one, three people are proposing how they would divide up the kingdom after they've deposed the king. And they say that they're going to do this by dividing up the kingdom of England on the lines of rivers. The Severn River will divide off Wales from southern and northern England, but the Trent River, uh, which you can see marked, And one of the people who's given the northern portion says he objects to this because the Trent doesn't flow in the right direction. He says the way that the Trent River flows, it's one of the few rivers in England that flows north. It flows from that area up towards the countryside in East Cumber. The Trent River used to empty into the Wash, the Dewey uh, Mine. And so his actual proposal in this play, and it's usually played for comedy value, but it seems to me to be quite serious, is we'll have Trent turn. We'll make it run in a new channel to run eastwards because then this will give him more land in this division between these three, three people. At this point, they've yet to depose Henry, so this is all sort of a, a purely notional way of that they might divide up a kingdom. But it's this idea that the rivers don't work in the way that the, the politics might. And so the physical landscape and the political landscape don't always fit together in neat, uh, simple ways. Many rivers that have that strategic importance today are also changed by what people are doing to them. This is actually the River Jordan. When I crossed the River Jordan, this incredibly important strategic river, my reaction was that's the River Jordan. It looks like a small stream, very, very small. Now, part of the reason for that is a lot of the water is diverted upstream to use uh, for uh, agricultural purposes. And so the flow of the river has now been greatly reduced by that. Um, it flows out of this landscape here, and you can see why then they want to divert this landscape. This is another bicycling uh, story. When I, I cycled around um, the Sea of Galilee, it's about 45 miles, um, and it's a very interesting one because it's kind of geopolitics by bicycle. You can see all sorts of interesting things in that landscape. There is a cycle path all the way around, but you do have to cross through a minefield. Uh, they've cleared the bike lane through this minefield, but with fences either side, it's just one way to keep people on the bike lane, I'm afraid, and not to, to stray either side of it. But it's an interesting one because you cross through occupied territory. The east bank of the Sea of Galilee is, strictly legally speaking, Syria, but this has been occupied by Israel for 45 plus years. Uh, and you cross very close to the Jordan, um, um, to Jordan country by crossing the Jordan River. So the, the, the sort of the physical landscape of this area uh, and the political landscape of this area in interesting ways uh, interconnected around that. I'll take one, one further example, which maybe um, connects to some of the things that you're explicitly interested in, then we'll go to, to, to questions. Another interesting, fascinating case is Macau. Um, Macau is formerly a peninsula and two offshore islands that was under Portuguese control until the same time that uh, Hong Kong was handed back to China uh, by the British, Portugal handed back Macau to the, to the Chinese. And what's interesting about this for me is the combination of the physical landscape, the human built environment, and the political uh, registers to this. So if you look at the peninsula um, as a connection to what is understood as mainland China, and then two offshore islands, so in the top right you can see these as distinct islands in that orangey color. They've actually filled in the land between the two islands. This is actually now the Kotai Strip where they've built all those mega casinos. These make the ones in Vegas look small. They're enormous. They have um, made this into a, a reclaimed land area on which they have built these enormous complex sites. So this area here is fully reclaimed land on which they've built uh, these casinos. The airport is also a construction, a long way to construction out into the sea 
And from there, I'll show you another map. You can see this in, in slightly more detail. So that purple area in number seven is all the extended land that has been built between those two islands. Now, north of the, the north of the two islands, so it's in the area between the Venetian line and the island of Capua, they are also building the uh, orange and under construction zone, the more uh, land sale project between the Venetian and the Farnese of Macau. But this isn't enough for all of the things that Macau wants to do in this area. So this area here is the new campus of the University of Macau. And it's actually in what is now sort of mainland China. And they've built a bridge and a tunnel to connect up so that you can go from Macau into this area of the campus. But it's actually like an area within China. Now this is interesting. For somebody like me with a British passport, you can go to Macau without a visa, but you can't go to mainland China without a visa. So it raises interesting questions if you can now go to China as a guest of the University of Macau, but without a visa to get into China because this is an area that has been kind of sectioned off. You can't move from there into China itself. You have to go back into Macau as the one of the official crossing points into mainland China. But what's interesting there is you have Macau, which is now part of China, but not quite part of China. It has a different legal regime but it's now incorporated into China, but with a different economic system, that is leasing land from a special economic zone within China, which also has a different jurisdiction to most of the states of China itself. And it has all sorts of interesting, I think, political, legal, jurisdictional issues about what kind of regime, what kind of law would apply if there was a fire on campus or an attack on campus, which military, sorry, which police or, or fire service would respond to that kind of issue. And it's all to do with the architecture, the building, the, the urbanism, the expansion, and the, the literal production of space through uh, the reclaimed land project, because this campus connects to an area of reclaimed land, which used to be sea. In that area. So it seems to me, in that issue, you have a number of the issues that you're interested in, that I'm interested in, around this kind of physical, material nature of thinking about territory uh, and politics. Thank you. I want to kind of make a gap between what you talked about and some of your other work with regards to reinterpreting the geo and geopolitics. I think you mentioned Simon Dolby there. And I mean, you talked about with, with regards to her uh, old Greek geometers. So in this age of natural boundaries or natural bodies such as carbon emissions are escaping territory, um, do you see new territorial formations in this new age? Has territory shifted? What is the new layer on that palimpsest that this new carbon emission is bringing? The question was trying to connect up some of the things I've been talking about. Simon Dolby, a uh, political geographer, has been talking about a geopolitics of climate change. And one of the things that uh, I think his work is interesting in doing there is to say, if we're going to think about the geopolitics of climate change, we need to really think about the question of the geo. We can't just do politics of climate change in kind of big international relations of climate change. We need to think about what's happening to the transformation of how we see the earth, the geo, in the politics of climate change. And the, the, the truly interrogating those kind of questions will, will raise important ways of thinking about that. So one of the ways that I suggest is that somebody like Simon Dolby is not doing something like Anthony Giddens or John Uri who've both written about what might be called the geopolitics of climate change. By that, they often mean the international wrangling between states about who will sign up to which kinds of um, restrictions or who will buy the, the carbon trading and all this kind of thing. What's happening to the geo? What's happening to the physical geography around that? Now, I've only begun thinking about those kind of questions. One of the things that I'm interested in with a team of people from Durham University and elsewhere is in the Arctic because the impact of climate change and, and global warming following from climate change is that this is transforming the physical nature of the high Arctic. Uh, 
you would have areas that previously were ice bound all year round and now navigable some parts of the year or increasingly more and more parts of the year. This is changing the way that, for example, Canada is thinking about the northern part of its territory. Canada has always traditionally seen that the, the ice to the north of Canada is simply an extension of the land that Canada lays claim to. The US particularly is now saying if there is a navigable passage, the famous Northwest Passage, uh, through the northern part of Canada from the Atlantic to the Pacific, then this should be an international waterway. So there's a, a physical transformation to the landscape that is going on because of these uh, carbon emissions and the associated uh, global warming from there that is transforming some of the ways that we think about this. Now, traditional political geography, even international law about these questions hasn't been very good at addressing some of those questions. It's tended to think of land and water. And land has got a body of law about territory and water has got the International law of the, um, Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, people, Phil Steinberg is the key person who's been proposing this. What about ice? Ice can be solid at some times, but it can become water at other times. It changes, it's a dynamic feature of the landscape. It can change at different times of the year and it can change due to temperature and some of these transformations. Do we need a different way of thinking about this to come up with the complexities of something like ice as a dynamic process? And that seems to me to be very important work, but I also wonder whether actually land territory has never been quite as straightforward as people think it is. A lot of land territory uh, going through mountain ranges, glaciers, again, an ice formation, but the transformation of these, of rivers not being fixed and that rivers changing as a result of uh, both human intervention in an active sense, but also through transformations of climate and so on. So there's a whole set of ways in which I think those complexities and, and climate change seems to me to raise some of those in a more extreme form. So that's what some of us are trying to do uh, around those questions. It's, so it's taking that geophysical very seriously in terms of the, the geopolitical. So whether it's another layering or a, an element within the palimpsest, but territory for me is something that is not fixed and created once and for all. Territory is something that's in a continual process of making and remaking, both by physical natural processes and by uh, human actions and, of course, the, the complicated interaction of those two things. So that, that's what some of us are trying to think about with these questions. The, the project is called ICE Law, um, and ICE now stands for indeterminate and changing environments rather than just ICE uh, as the physical process. But it's to try and get to grips with, with some of those complexities. Thank you for your lecture. It was very interesting. And actually, I'm interested in the natural borders uh, because we have like our human borders, but uh, animals, they don't share our <laughs> human borders. And uh, for example, if we have some natural area or area of one, I don't know, some animal controlling it and it's going through, and our border is going through this area, what is your opinion about it? The best person I know who's written about precisely that question is a Swiss geographer, Juliette Fall, who wrote a book called Drawing the Line, which came out maybe eight years ago, something like that, which was around transboundary natural resource management and transboundary natural parks that were set up between states. So if the, the habitat of a particular animal, and it could be from um, a small bug or a butterfly or something up to a large mammal, uh, would cross an international boundary. How do states regulate precisely that kind of question? So, so Juliet's work would be the place I'd suggest to look for those questions, because what you often find, and the, the example of the U.S.-Mexico border is a, that if you build that border in a way that stops humans passing across it, then you also restrict the movement of animals. And so they tried to make it with uh, enough space between the, the vertical pillars of that in order that animals could move between them. But um, often animals are restricted by the same kinds of things that humans are restricted by. And so there's different ways that they try to resolve those kinds of questions. But certainly the, the human impact on the, the physical landscape has had all sorts of natural um, resource implications. There's also a large body of work on things like rivers, that rivers don't simply form a, either a dividing line or a means of crossing between, but rivers are a natural resource that need to be managed in terms of um, water flow. If, if one state builds a dam 
um, for hydropower, then this is going to restrict the flow further downstream for other states. So there's a lot of bilateral agreements for natural boundary resource management. So there's a literature around those kind of questions as well. Um, but again, it's this interrelation of the, the geophysical and the geopolitical that's interesting. Uh, so that, those would be the places I'd suggest to go to. Okay, I'll take the opportunity to ask Please. a question. Um, I'm not sure I should stand up and share. Yeah, I, I kind of note the, uh, where you start off with your interest in territory is looking at some of the existing and perhaps over obvious definitions, particularly those kind of behavior mm -hmm. models where human culture is kind of unfortunately equated with uh, an animal's territory. But I wonder if you uh, reflected on that and returned to that. I'm just kind of thinking of, you said you've gone back to, to terms such as terrain and land. I think, especially if one talks about landscape, uh, there's a notion that this is, you know, for good or bad, that often the people do feel a sense or a people construct themselves on the basis that they feel a sense of belonging to that and also a kind of ownership of that. I mean, there, clearly we're not just in the realms of behaviour, we're in the realms of ideology as well, but nevertheless it, it kind of becomes something that is not reducible or sort of the other way around. You, you can't entirely remove this, this notion of a people belonging to a land, at least as a kind of political uh, expression. Um, I've not gone back to the territoriality literature. I, I found the territoriality literature to be to be problematic because so many people did think that because there was literature on territoriality, we then had a literature on territory. And, and I found that problematic because of the way that people tried to, to slip between those terms. So, so very, very often when I talked about territory, people would answer saying, but territoriality is, and they'd say, no, I'm talking about territory. And, and I felt that the, the blurring between them was a problem. But I wouldn't want to reduce all of the literature on territoriality to the behaviorist kind of way of doing it. And some of it is certainly closer to what you're talking about in terms of the a sense of belonging or a sense of attachment to place. And there's a lot of literature on those kinds of questions that I think is interesting. I think, think certainly the cultural could be another sort of register when I talked about the political, geographical, and then the, the economic, strategic, legal, and technical. You could certainly add in the cultural as a register that I don't particularly talk about, but that, that could be added in as a dimension of that and that perhaps I neglected. At the moment, I'm most, most interested in really thinking further on the material element in that and, and the material, the geophysical in that. Mm. But you could, do, you could do work on the cultural and some of the people, so I mentioned Gaston Gordillo who's working about terrains and anthropologists, so clearly those kind of questions come in for him around that. Uh, but also in this ice law projects, there's anthropologists interested in, in that kind of question because uh, one of the issues if you're looking at the Arctic, which is different from the Antarctic, is the indigenous populations there and the particular way they understand those lands and the way that those are being transformed by the implications of, of the climate change and the, the, the physical processes. So those are elements that, that would also need to be, be thought about around that. Um, the landscape work, I mean, I, I know some of the work on landscape and tried to think through what that was doing. I was intrigued by the fact that a lot of landscape work doesn't really define land. It talks much more about the scape, the, the visual element of it, but yeah. the, the land register doesn't seem to me to be particularly well unpacked as a term, so I think that would be worth doing something with. But I think one of the things that this work on territory raised for me was you could always add in another way of looking at these kinds of questions beyond the ones that, that, that I do into it, um, some of which I might try and address and others which others can address around those questions. But um, I have this, this vague notional idea that I might write a successor volume to the birth of territory one day and my working title for that is nationalism capitalism territory because i think a lot of those relations between nationalism and capitalism people have tended i think quite often see that nationalism and capitalism produce territory whereas for me quite often what they do is they are produced within territories and then go on and reproduce or shape or retransform those territories 
there's a line Neil Brenner and I use in, in a piece that we wrote about the states-based territory relation where we riff on that idea of Marx and we say, you know, states make their own territories, but they don't make them under circumstances of their own choosing. They make them under the given and inherited situation that, that they find. They can transform. They can do all sorts of things. States, I mean, just down the road from here at Tottenham Court Road, that's a large-scale state infrastructure project that is going to change the territory of London, the Crossrail project. That is something that the states are doing, uh, the state is doing to transform um, any kind of roads that are built, any kinds of rail lines, any kinds of reclaimed land projects on coastlines. These are, are pro productions and transformations of territory, but that doesn't mean that there was nothing there before that, that, and that it was a completely blank slate that they could construct on. So it's that continual production and reproduction of territory, and, and nationalism and capitalism are two of the key forces that do that today, but I don't think they, they come from nowhere. Um, that they are within that. So that, that for me would be that relation between those terms, but that's a, a much vaguer future project at this stage. Well, first of all, thank you for, for the lecture. I think it's very relevant to what we are producing in the, in the program. Uh, well, basically in the, in the program, we claim, uh, or we're trying to claim in the, in the brief for this year and for previous years that territory could be uh, designed here, uh, could be something that architects could engage with, not only as a way to understand contemporary conditions, but actually to design contemporary conditions. And for example, there are a number of different projects that seem to be coordinated. Like for example, there's an organization called DeltaNet uh, that try to see how deltas around Europe, for example, uh, are uh, you know, behaving, what's happening with them, etc. There's another one called Room for the River, for example, that was you talking about river change, and there are even space for that. No? And, and and we claim uh, that well, architects are not sufficiently engaged uh, in those sorts of uh, agreements or uh, organization. For example, there's also the Florence Convention no, that try to say, well, that's the way in which there should be a way in which we coordinate efforts and we, and we say how we manage, build landscapes, etc. And uh, so I don't know if through, throughout your research, uh, uh, historically, etc., you have seen, you know, such an interest of engagement of architects. Because architects are always seen, you know, at the at the end of the process. You know, like for example, in the crossrail and all that stuff, mm. uh, architects are hired to, you know, after somebody produces the piece, uh, there's a policy maker that says, well, there's things that needs to be done, and then the architect comes and provides the solution, but not as you know part of the policy making. Okay. And we think, well, maybe that's also called design. And I don't know if you have come across uh, sort of engagement with design. Right? I think that's an interesting question, and for me, and you know, this is somebody without the architecture background that you all have. Where, where do you draw the line between what is design, what is architecture, what is town planning or urbanism, and, and civil engineering? And those, to, to, to somebody outside, it seems to me that those are always entangled and intertwined. And in somewhere like Israel Palestine, particularly in the West Bank, I mean, I was never, I have to admit, never really interested in roads, bridges, tunnels, etc., until I went there. And I could see just how explicitly political those kinds of questions were in a place like there. And architecture is very clearly a political thing. This is why um, Eyal Weissman's work on the, the um, Israel's architecture of occupation, the, the civilian occupation book that he did. And then now recently his project on what he calls forensic architecture. Um, how this connects up to somebody like Gaston Gordia's work about rubble and kind of what is done to, um, to buildings and then the transformation of that. I'm interested in things, and part of this comes from my interest in Foucault's work about the repurposing of old spaces for new purposes. Um, so Foucault has this famous passage at the beginning of uh, the History of Madness where he says the, the old um, lazarettos where they put uh, people suffering from leprosy were first turned into places where you would keep people who were venereally diseased, sexual diseases, and then became the asylums they turned into. So they, they reused the spaces for new purposes and you would do something to the internal architecture of these buildings for the, for the new purpose. But that kind of transformation, again, that point of kind of the, the instead of production from nothing, it's the, the making and remaking of, of spaces or, or for me, as it goes up in scale, perhaps it's territories. So I'm interested in those kinds of questions, but um, 
for me so far most of the engagement has been with people that are working on kind of urbanism type questions of which I suppose architecture is a part um, somebody like Neil Brenner's work for example at the, the Harvard Graduate School of Design very interested in how his work on the urban and my work on territory connect in, in, in I think interesting ways but I'm interested in why not why in how kind of the architectural question figures in those kinds of debates and, and how whether there's a scale distinction or whether there's a different kind of distinction of how you would connect up what I've been interested in kind of urban questions and to an extent sort of civil engineering to, to architecture itself so that that's where not that I have a good answer but that's where I'm kind of interested in how conversation might go uh, around those questions but I'm interested I mean if, if, if you say architects are getting interested in river deltas for example I mean that that's fascinating to me because a river delta is a particularly interesting um, geomorphological process because it, it will have all sorts of questions about tidal and seasonal things so the example I gave of the Nile River for example flooding and erasing the boundary markers and then moving the people back in um, that kind of question I think is really interesting in terms of how can, can our theories of territory take sufficient account of the geophysical um, and those processes and I suppose it would be how does architecture figure in that kind of link I think, I think that would be very interesting yeah uh, can I just follow on, on that um, yes. there's a couple of projects the student project, for example, on releasing rivers, no? and and one of the issues as well is like right now uh, in, in schools of architecture, how it seems to be more interested in naturalistic approaches, no? like how rivers look like, you know, are they abused, they look amazing, the, the kind of formation they produce, and somehow, for example, rivers for the river are always more directed towards environmentalist approach, no? like uh, uh, it's good to release rivers, but in a way what we think and that's why uh, one of the reasons why we brought this here is the conflict that arises when we release those rivers not like uh, mm -hmm. the question you pose at the end like when a river changed direction uh, for sure that was uh, that land was owned by somebody that is either losing or gaining land and so how uh, we think that architects uh, not only could you know maybe modify uh, prevent adjust uh, that river course, but also negotiate or create tools for negotiation sure. that maybe, I don't know, geographers are, you know, detailing, writing about, but uh, we think that, for example, through cartography or the way we explain maybe intersectional cartography, that basically you can add to that way in which you can negotiate uh, uh, landscape, but that's more a comment. No, no, that, that's interesting. I mean, I'm just thinking about rivers in London, for example. I mean, they've recently there have been people talking more about the underground rivers of the rivers that have been buried within the city because of, of large-scale building projects and design projects and say the, the Fleet River for example where is the Fleet River now well it's nearly all underground and it empties into the Thames at a certain point but the old river Fleet Street is on part of the course of that river um, but equally the Thames with the Thames flood barrier this is no longer a river that can can work in a natural way because it would inundate large parts of the city with flood water if, if it didn't have that flood mechanism so you have this large scale kind of geoengineering project to think about those and you can look at this in terms of canals as well as another way of um, creating a water course that does what you want and flows the direction or goes the direction that you want in order to make it as a, a, um, a route of passage and some really interesting work has been done around those those kind of questions uh, Chandra Mukherjee's work on um, the Canal de Midi in France, for example, is a good study of that sort of political technology of landscape design type, type question. And for me, the, you know, where do you draw the line in that, of whether that's architecture or design or urbanism or, or whatever else it might be, I think is a, I mean, I'm almost tempted to say, I'm not really interested in where the line might be drawn, it's how the conversations can take place. Um, I should have said when I was talking about the volume work, I mean, I've said a bit about the stuff, the vertical geopolitics and the above the surface, but I think there's some really interesting work being done on kind of infrastructure and what is going on below the surface. Stephen Graham did a lot of work on those kinds of questions and then shifted from that to looking at more of the, the destruction of architecture, um, the destruction of infrastructure. Um, and that was partly because he gave a pres he was asked to go to a presentation um, in Israel and, and thought he was talking about how cities 
were built and how cities worked, and you realize that there were large numbers of Israeli Defense Force people there, and that this was actually a conference about how do you take a city apart, how do you destroy the infrastructure of a city. And so it became very interesting, that kind of politicized process. There's also people like Urban Explorers, Bradley Garrett, who's done some really interesting work in London and elsewhere, of what are the, the hidden spaces of cities that actually make those cities work. So the underground, um, the tunnels, the infrastructure, the abandoned um, mothballed rail um, underground railway stations that London Underground has, the old mail rail, which used to be a small gauge underground railway in London that delivered the post. Mail bags would go down chutes and they would go onto small trains that would run underneath the city. In the end, they closed it because they said it was five times more expensive to run it underground than run it on the surface of the city. But this was an area that he and his urban explorer friends um, broke into and took lots of photographs of this abandoned mothballed space within the city. Lots and lots of work about bunkers and the kind of the, the traces of what happened in the Cold War uh, and how those are being used, some of which are now being opened up as tourist destinations, but a lot of which are still classified and top secret. So it's the, the spaces that make possible the spaces that we are allowed to move through um, and live in and work in and uh, use as transport systems within the city. You can also do this, people have done this around um, shopping centres or um, big hotels. There's all sorts of bits of those that you never see if you're just the person who uses the airport who stays in the hotel, but the service um, areas and so on. And so the, the different ways that a, a space can be constructed and used by different people, I think there's interesting work being done about those questions. So part of that volume paper was an attempt to connect up the vertical geopolitics, what goes on above the surface, to what goes on below the surface, and that the subsoil as an important register of that, but also the submarine, what goes on below the surface of the sea. It's not just that the sea is a flat surface, but it's the depth of the sea that is interesting around some of these uh, questions. What the, the, the both obviously submarines, but also submarine infrastructure, cables for satellite links and so on. I think there's some interesting work being done about those questions. Actually, I'm Chinese, so I saw you present Macau. Mm. Yeah, Macau. And uh, actually, I know that the most famous, I mean, political boundary is the Great Wall. We know that, right? At the beginning, it's a defense structure. And but now, the, the it, it has been, you know, it, it now it's a heritage now, right? Right. So it's, it means it's crossed the, yep. the boundary now. But um, comparing to the uh, boundary between the mainland to the uh, Macau, we know um, the, the still in different political system. And uh, even we, we, we could find it's more hard to let human being to cross the boundary instead of you know, other settlements, just like animal, I mean, yeah. cross the bridge. Right. Right. So I want to know, and uh, because we know, uh, we study this, we want to try to encourage, encourage to, uh, how to say, to uh, decline the effect of this boundary, I mean, political boundary, and uh, to do some, I mean, maybe, um, you know, uh, in infrastructure and uh, can use by both sides and to benefit both sides. War, we just uh, according the, you know, different, I mean, technological level and mm -hmm. let them to on their own. War, we, you know, uh, just like I mentioned before, maybe, you know, from a landscape of urbanism, we could, maybe just like the uh, gas pipe, just like the railway, just like this kind of very, I mean, um, you know, um, fa um, primary factors, we could, you know, find a way to unite, to negotiate with, you know, both sides and to find a way to, uh, to how to say, to let, you know, both sides, you mm -hmm. know, benefit. So I don't know, you just let it be, or we should, you know, go ahead, move, you know, to cross this boundary. I'm not sure I understand the specific question about, is it about the ability to cross over a boundary? We encourage or not? I mean, okay. Well, I mean, my understanding with the, the mainland China Macau border is that the even for somebody with a Chinese passport, it's a restricted crossing and that um, not everybody is allowed to make that crossing and some people are allowed and some people are not allowed, and it depends on particular kinds of status or, or residence areas and so on. 
um, how long you're able to stay can also be restricted. And the, the I mean, I crossed from Hong Kong into mainland China. Um, I actually got myself into a bit of trouble because I, I, I wasn't supposed to be there and I didn't have a visa and I ended up in the, the lounge where you, you're going to go and there was no way to go back into Hong Kong without going through. So I got rather complicated negotiations. So I actually ended up going to China by mistake because I, I'd actually intended to go and look at the border because I'm interested in borders. But I didn't think this was a very smart thing to tell people to do, that I'm here to take some photographs of your border. So I sort of said, or oh, I, I got off the, the, um, the train, the metro train in the wrong place, and I really want to go back to Hong Kong, and that's where I'm... And they eventually, somebody said, well, do you want to go to China? And I said, well, sure, but I don't have a visa. And he said, well, we can give you a temporary pass. And so I was able to go to China for a few hours by crossing this. But it was an interesting example for me of the kind of where the borders are and the restriction of movement. And that I can go there without a visa to, to Hong Kong and Macau, but I can't go to China without a visa. And, um, but borders, I mean, people often think about borders as this way of simply restricting movement. I think they're much more to do with controlling movement. And the way in which people can pass through those differs on different kinds of status. If you go to any uh, airport, you can, there are fast track lanes if you've passed certain types of protocol ahead of time. You've got the electronic passport, you've got the biometric information, you've got all of these kinds of things. And even something like Hadrian's Wall was not a border in a simple sense of a complete barrier. Um, they cultivated land on both sides of the wall that they actually used it to channel movement through the gatehouses on the wall so that they could tax people as, and goods as they moved through it, rather than simply it being a defensible wall. So borders are a, a complicated process and whichever border you look at in the present but also historically will open up different kinds of questions about movement and so on. I was just particularly struck by the, the Macau example because of how complicated the, the overlapping different jurisdictions are and where these are sometimes marked by the physical landscape but sometimes more complicated around that. Because as I, I began to understand, and, and you and others will have much more knowledge about this, but the, the different economic regimes in different parts of southern China and the different sort of experiments with um, economic systems that are going on in some places compared to others and then that raises a whole set of legal jurisdictional issues about movement. So when I got my temporary visa, it was only to go into uh, a certain province, rather than I, I couldn't have then extended beyond that and go into other areas of, of China. So that one of the, you know, and that raises for me a question that's very much a, a case in a very different register with, with the West Bank, that we have tended to think too much of the West Bank wall as this border effectively being constructed illegally on occupied land and so on, but as a border that you cross over. And the West Bank isn't like that. The West Bank is a fractured, multiply bordered space. There's all sorts of barriers, blockages, things that are going on within that space. Yes, there is the wall, and the wall with all of its very complicated geometries and, and, and geographies of, of occupation and construction. But there are many roads that have been blocked, permanently blocked, either by being having an area blown up or by large barriers being erected or blockades put in there to restrict movement within there or to, to channel movement in different directions within the West Bank to bypass a, an Israeli settlement, for example, that now the route a Palestinian might have to take from a village to another village or a village from which they are farmland becomes a much longer route because they're now forced down particular kinds of ways. So those fractured spaces of the border not simply being at the edges of states, I think is increasingly common. I don't go quite so far as the border is everywhere, literature. I think the border is in more than, than simply the old traditional places the border was. But I think if we say the border is everywhere, then it's difficult sometimes to distinguish the different degrees of which bordering practices take place. But for me, the, the Macau one was interesting because the border is shifting for some purposes, but not for other purposes. Movement is being restricted for some reasons and not for others. And I, well, going up to the border between Macau and, and the mainland, the people coming over the border, and I worked this out because it was a very easy way to get around Macau, are met by all of the buses, by all the different casinos, because they want to try and entice trade. So if you use this almost like as a bus interchange, you could go up there and get on a different casino's bus, and it would take you to a different part of the island. And it's the, the channeling of movement, often people coming over with no luggage, going to the casinos and with nowhere to stay, if they get lucky and they, they win, then they might get a hotel room and, and all of the other things that people who've won large in the casino might, might do for entertainment. Uh, but if they don't, then they'll end up effectively sleeping in the casino, sleeping in a chair in the casino until they go back over the border. 
And so the, a lot of the big hotels they're building are up unoccupied. The casinos are full, but there's not the, not the hotels above them because a lot of people who's coming over the border just to gamble and they're only actually using a lot of the other infrastructure facilities if they actually um, win in the casino. So there's, for me, all sorts of issues that I've never been particularly interested in, you know, in, in Vegas or, or other casinos. But here in Macau, suddenly these became very interesting to me because of these different ways that the space was being used. And that Macau becomes this sort of, this is where we will tolerate that kind of behavior but that we then don't have to have this in other parts of mainland China. I thought that was an intriguing way of thinking about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.